Yeah, you know, we're going to talk about your books some before you leave as well, some in English, some in Italian. Uh, but you've heard my questions. Just try to answer them because you really are an expert. Accurately predicted that they would put a Jesuit pope in, name the guy, one of two you thought it would be, that was a blackmail going on. That all came out in the newsletter. So you've been proven correct in spades over and over again. Uh, so briefly, tell us about yourself, how you woke up, then are they getting stronger, are they getting weaker, uh, who runs the Vatican? Well, actually, how I woke up, uh, you are uh, probably one of the reasons why in the year 2000, 2001, I started to wonder what was really going on behind the scenes. Because I didn't even know that. The even amongst that, among the network of Masonic network and of other secret societies, when we saw the Bohemian Grove, it created a debate. I remember myself discussing in Lodge in London your documentary and actually facing some of the masters there and telling them, what is this? I mean, how is it possible that Tony Blair goes and participates in something like this or, or, or that world leaders are involved with something like this? And, and of course, uh, uh, this uh, inspiration that you gave me, uh, at one point, uh, put me in front of the reality of what I had uh, in, in these lodges, in these uh, secret societies with, uh, that I was involved in, and I decided that I did no longer wanted to be involved, especially when I discovered some uh, of their secrets. Uh, of course, uh, the lower level never know what's going on at the upper levels. So it was by... The, the possibility of climbing suddenly this ladder that I was able to see that uh, it wasn't something I wanted to be uh, any longer uh, a participant with, especially after the phone call I had once with uh, Marcinkus, uh, which was, uh, as you know, a very important uh, uh, bishop. He died uh, around uh, nearly 10 years ago. Uh, who was in charge uh, and very much uh, in charge of the Vatican at the time of John Paul II, who the Italian actually government wanted to arrest, but the Vatican simply sent uh, to the U.S. This is what they do. They don't uh, get their people arrested. When uh, uh, last year uh, was asked that, that the cardinal was arrested for pedophilia, they just picked him up and made him reside in the Vatican until he eventually died of his sickness a month ago. And... Uh, this is because they protect him, because, uh, of course, if this cardinal, who was part of the pedophilia ring that is running the Vatican, will talk, it will, it will put in trouble a lot of people, because uh, there is two factions. The main factions now is the Jesuit, who is working with the Mondialists uh, to uh, try to save the facade of the Catholic Church, and then there is the a gay lobby, which is headed by this cardinal called Tarcisio Bertone, and uh, who, who worked uh, in collaboration with, well, right with that guy who picked up that little girl, that guy called uh, Domenico Gianni, who is one of the most powerful people in the Vatican, even if he's unknown to the American public. He is uh, one of the reasons why uh, the, the, the Pope has not been able to totally kick out the, 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 the pedophile rings because he, together with Tarcisio Bertone, ran this uh, check. So you're the, saying uh, the, the Jesuits use the weakness that the, that the pedophile lobby created to come in and take over. You're saying they're two different factions. Yes. They're two different factions, but in the How do the Dominicans together. tie in? Aren't they a third faction? The Dominicans, unfortunately, have been infiltrated a long time ago. In fact, the, the guy who founded the Liberation Theology was himself a Dominican. So there is a conservative faction within the Dominican. There is also a conservative faction within other orders. And it's thanks to these conservatives who I have access to a lot of information, which I give in my book, Pope Francis, the Last Pope. So uh, there is good people in the Vatican. So are they doing this because they're weak or because they're strong? Why, are they, why is the church openly joining with world government? There, uh, at this point, uh, there is uh, uh, no more church. I mean, now it's been completely taken over. The Jesuits are just uh, an emanation of this uh, globalist agenda. Since 1958, uh, the church has been compromised. This, all traditional Catholics know this. And when the, the, they started with the Second Vatican Council, the, the church was completely compromised. And uh, it's never been going back. After that, there was no going back because we had the Freemasons Pope. I mean, we had uh, Ron Calli, who, who became a pope in 1958, who was a Freemason. Then we have Montini, who was also a Freemason. These are, are not ordinary Masons. These are people who were connected to also the Zionist agenda, 
which uh, in turn was linked with the Jesuit agenda. So here we can't really blame only one faction for all the troubles of the world, as you know very well, uh, Alex, after all these years of doing excellent reports. It's, uh, it's something much more complex. There is a hierarchy structure that is compartmentalized, and, of course, uh, they work together, the main factions are the Jesuits, together with the Zionists. This is to summarize it in a very synthetic form. And what is the end goal of the top people running this whole planetary program? Of course, uh, the main goal is to maintain the privileges of the aristocrats who officially have lost their royalty status but are still there, apart from the English royal family, which still keeps that royalty status quite alive, but transforming the EU in the new sacred Roman Empire. Because this is the, really, in a way, also the full feeling of the scriptures uh, is something that has been even prophesied. So it's very interesting. Sure, the Club of Rome, uh, all of it, the Treaty of Rome 57, created the European Union. Absolutely, and this European Union now is enslaving and imposing on the European people all these immigrants, uh, the constant chaos in the streets. Every night in Rome, when uh, you were even around, Alex... There were huge demonstrations, were, yeah, clashes. The, but but there were clashes. There were actually uh, riots in the streets. There were immigrants who invade, invade buildings without having any permit. They just simply invade the building because it's empty. And then after that, you can't kick them out any longer. So uh, what the, the mondialists, what they do, they pick up the immigrants at the train station and they bring them to these buildings where they themselves actually break down the end and then they say, take over the building. I mean, this is what happens these days in Rome at night. Uh, so it, it's quite incredible, the situation. We have, uh, of course, uh, what's happening in Hungary, what's happening in all the borders. I mean, this huge immigration is made for us uh, to, 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 of course, uh, become uh, more controlled. And in the end, uh, you know, they will keep on making more money and we will keep on being more and more Sure, poor. sure. They don't want a homo homogeneous population. Take Mexico. If, if, if it was powerful and wealthy, the globalists want to bring in groups to divide it up so that the Mexicans could never get together politically and throw out the outside globalist group. You've got the outside global corporations bringing in their own client groups that, that will then basically work and speak for them like 21st century mercenaries, and that's all stated, it's all admitted. I want to go to some phone calls with Leo Zagami uh, here joining us. Before he leaves us, uh, though, in, in the next segment, uh, briefly tell folks how they get your latest book, which I've read, it's excellent, in English, The Last Pope, and why you say he's the last pope. Pope Francis, the last pope, because uh, nowadays the sacrality of the pope, uh, uh, the, the, the office of the pope has been destroyed after the resignation of Ratzinger. The last pope, because possibly after this pope we will not have any more a Catholic church as we were used to, you know, and it will be this mondialist church, ecumenical church made of many different creeds. Uh, and so, I don't know if you noticed, but yesterday during the canonization, all the cardinals were dressed in white. And like the Pope, there was no difference. By the way, you so, said that, because we have like five hours of you talking, you said they'll probably get two or three popes, then a whole council. It's all about devolving power so no one can target the organization and having oligarch councils, and that's what a communist system would do, and that's exactly what they're doing now. In fact, I'm very worried, really, for the, the meeting that is going to be taking place between Obama and Putin, because Putin could be the only real, real opposition to this whole setup, but he probably just going to marry into the whole thing and, 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 you know, make this BRICS just the fake opposition to the World Bank. I mean, so uh, in that case... Uh, uh, let's say that the meetings that will take place in the next few days in New York are probably the most important meetings of the new millennium. Absolutely, and our reporters know that. We're going to be here covering it. Let me ask you this question, uh, Leo. I've studied Putin. He's obviously a hardcore guy, but he's trying to promote family, trying to promote having kids. They're, they don't yes. put fluoride in the water. The, the, his best friend's a newscaster. I'm going to skip this break, last one of the day. His best friend's a newscaster that basically sounds like my show. Uh, and I've been told by the head of RT... America years ago, the State Department didn't want me on there anymore, which is fine. It's not that big of a deal. Um, that they were upset that I was on there and that basically the directors of RT 
both in Russia and here, are huge listeners. And I was told this by their producers, by their top people, and told this in L.A. I'm just going to leave it at that, where they have one of their main offices, and that the Russian government actually watches this show. Now, imagine you're told this. It's not a way to flatter me or get me to support them. I'm not in with the Russians. They don't need me. I'm just promoting national sovereignty, anti-globalism, which allows Russia to continue on. I mean, I want Russia to be there. I want America to be there. I want diversity in countries. I want sovereignty. I'm just a patriot for humanity, a patriot for sovereignty, a patriot for due process, a patriot for firewalls to tyranny. That's what countries are. But, you know, I was told this five years ago, oh, you're just, you know, six, seven years ago, I thought, oh, you're just wanting me to, you know, be flattered so I support you. And they're like, no, no, we're not. And now I've seen, because uh, these Russians were in awe every time they came here. Uh, then I've seen now out of Russian television, it's like it's Alex Jones on Russian TV. It looks like the Russians might have caught an anti-New World Order bug. I know that Putin started secretly meeting with Alexander Schultz and Nietzsche a lot, reportedly apologized to him. Now he's become a big Orthodox Christian, like underground, uh, and thinks he's got to, you know, save Christendom. Or is that PR bull? Or, or, or is this how God works in mysterious ways? Orthodox Church up until now has been the only real opposition to the Catholic uh, uh, agenda, which uh, is uh, really becoming anti-Christian by all nature. And you see in this yourself. So if the Orthodox Church is genuine, in that case, we are in front uh, of a great clash uh, that is about to happen because uh, it started in Ukraine between Catholics and Orthodox is now manifesting to a full scale with this uh, second Cold War. So I think that we will see in the next few days in New York if this is really a charade or if there is really about uh, to, to start something that could become a clash of information. Will you come on with us Monday after we've seen what happens this weekend and tomorrow and give us your analysis on what you think it means, whether it was real or not? Sure, why not? I will be fully available for that, and it's a pleasure to be on InfoWars because nowadays the Italian media will never have me again on. Yeah, uh, that's a whole uh, other subject. I looked it up and found the news articles. You didn't make a big deal about it. You actually got grabbed by uh, Vatican officers, taken to a facility uh, outside Rome, and then it, and then thrown back on the street. I mean, they are really after you. Yeah, well, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, to be brought actually forcibly in an ambulance in, a, in in an hospital and then apparently you you think you are in a hospital and suddenly you have a doctor who is actually a priest arriving in front of you uh, both with the doctor thing and the priestly thing here and then a bunch of monks arriving in the morning i, I mean it was pretty scary definitely so i, I i'm trying to uh, keep myself now low profile and avoiding these kind of problems uh, and uh, simply by not involving myself anymore in italian politics because uh, it's a lost cause in any case that's right. You ended up uh, running for office, being involved with the Nationalist Party, or, or, or give me the proper name, and I and I and then I guess it there was were... uh, basically uh, the it's a party of the Berlusconi coalition known as the Grande Sud, which is basically a party for the South of Italy, which uh, was uh, quite prominent a few years ago. And of course, your family's been quite prominent in politics. That's one reason you were also given entrance into some of these more secret orders. Yes, uh, my grandfather was a senator. He even marched uh, on Rome with Mussolini back in the days, uh, and uh, not that uh, that can be something. But in, in any case, uh, I have had the possibility of being an insider. And uh, the, the crazy thing is that when I actually went against the president of Italy live on TV, the pro producer of the show on Rai Uno, which is the main Italian state channel, came to me and said, how is possible you're doing this to us? You are one of us. You are bourgeois. You are not a peasant. You are not one of them, of the masses. You have to be with us. And I said, I'm not. Forget it. So, I mean, that was it for me in Italy. And immediately after that, soon after, I was uh, basically, they broke down into my house. They broke my, my door in the morning. All kinds of things happened, which uh, I will not uh, now describe because it will take time from your transmission. But it wasn't pleasant. I mean, democracy is inexistent when you oppose the system. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's go to some phone calls uh, here. We're going to take you to the next segment. Then we've got another special guest on geoengineering, breaking into the mainstream news with the California situation. Uh, let's go to uh, Dion in Illinois. Thanks for holding her on the air with Leo Zagami. Yeah, uh, Argentina writer uh, Pedro Salons claimed that uh, 
Fidel Castro made a prophetic quote in 1973. He said the U.S. will come to talk to us when they have a black president and the world has a Latin American pope. And Fidel Castro had a address to a teacher. And uh, when he went to Cuba, they changed the book. So I don't know if you know what the books were about and how did Fidel Castro